So as Sandy said, I've been teaching here a long time. I think it's someplace in the vicinity of 20 years. And a lot, this is a part of a book manuscript that I'm working on that comes out of having taught this course in the, in the modeling sequence here and having taught a scope of political science course back at Rochester, um, which if you're not a political, if you're a political scientist, you know has a certain reputation um, for being fond of formal models. Um, and um, I am not a formal modeler myself, uh, but I spend a lot of time thinking about them. I'm a political theorist um, of the sort that most of you avoid. Um, normative theory, you know, that's when you get the garlic out and wear it around your neck and uh, keep the vampires away. But um, so a lot of what I've been thinking that's come out in this, uh, in this project it comes directly from teaching in the summer program. So there's a, there's a lesson for you there, which is your teaching and your research are not separable. You learn a lot from students who have um, disbelieving questions. Um, and um, I've learned a lot here um, from, from doing that. Uh, the title of the paper is Models as Fables. Um, and that's the view that I'm going to defend. The view that I'm going to uh, criticize is what I call the standard rationale for, for using models in political science. This is true in political science if you're a sociologist or if you're an economist, it obtains for you too, right? So this is one of those instances in which the political scientist can say, oh yeah, this holds for economics as well. Most kind of talks like this by economists say, oh yeah, you know, those other disciplines, you know, we might, uh, we might include them. Um, I presented it at a whole bunch of places. I don't know whether you can really see that very well. Once, two years ago, I presented it in here. There was no paper at that point. It was just sort of thoughts. Um, and now there's a paper, and there's a lesson here as well uh, for you, which is it takes a long time to get papers done. Um, and not because you're lazy, but because it's hard. Um, you may be lazy as well. I don't want to cast aspersions. But um, it's hard to figure things out. And doing it again and again and again in front of audiences is a good way to learn how not finished you are. Um, and so I'm hoping tonight will be another, uh, another example of that. So you might be interested in why somebody who studies democratic theory cares about this topic. And it comes from having spent the better part of a decade writing a set of papers and then this book with my, my co-author Jack Knight um, that relies on, it's a book of democratic theory, and it relies on a lot of formal results. It does not rely on formal results in the way that political scientists tend to think we ought to. And it also got, I would say, essentially epsilon uptake among democratic theorists because it relies on formal results and most democratic theorists don't um, really want to spend the time or the effort to sort of fathom what's going on with formal, formal models. Um, and so part of my perplexity has been to figure out what is it that we were doing in this book that was so foreign um, to, uh, to both people in my tribe and to people uh, more generally in political science. And there's a bunch of papers, um, one of which um, this one, 2014, um, is about how normative theorists use models. And the argument of that paper is that they use models in essentially the way that I'm going to defend tonight. I'm going to try and make an argument in this larger book man manuscript that there is no way to differentiate what Rawls and Foucault are doing from what Arrow and McKelvey and Schofield and so on are doing in political science. There's no distinction. So that should send people running for the door. I'll turn around so you can, so that, you know, I'll just hear the door slamming behind me. Um, so there's a bunch of caveats here uh, that I'm not going to talk about tonight. The first one is that political scientists tend to assume that the sole way Certainly the most important way of assessing the practice and the progress of science is empirically. And in fact, philosophers of science don't believe that. And part of the problem is, is that in political science and sociology, practitioners stopped reading the philosophy of science in roughly 1970. 
And so if you get a, you know, a reference to Popper or Kuhn, you think that you're au courant, but not so. Um, and so people like Larry Loudon and Philip Kitcher, who disagree philosophically about a whole range of things, agree in their writings in the philosophy of science that we have a kind of multi-dimensional set of criteria in which we care about emp empirical performance, surely, but we also care a lot about technical progress in performance, right? How do we, for example, make progress in the, in the design and construction of survey instruments? That's not directly empirical. It's a set of tools or methodology. And that's why you're here at the summer camp, right? Is to, is to, is to learn about recent progress or established practice in using methodological tools. And we make progress on those grounds. And we have disagreements, right? So if you hear about the frequentists and the Bayesians, they have a whole set of things that they think are really important differences between them, even though they're both doing statistical modeling. We also, in this, on this view, make progress conceptually or not, right? And that's what I'm going to be focusing on tonight. So we make progress conceptually in particular when we think about causal mechanisms. Now that's something that statistical models largely leave out of the question, right? Especially the fad for causal inference these days. But mostly causal mechanisms are not observable directly. Right? So we have, for example, in rational choice models in particular, we have beliefs and preferences, neither of which are directly observable. We have institutions, for example, that are not directly observable. You cannot see the market, for example. You cannot see the Supreme Court. Many of you will wish that we couldn't see the Supreme Court at all in any manifestation. But so part of the issue here is thinking about how concepts enter into our um, into our work. And this is squarely within the view of science that includes biology and chemistry and physics as well as social sciences. So nothing I say here offends against the idea that what we're doing or trying to do is scientific. It depends on how you understand the criteria of science. The second one, we tend to, we tend to have this dichotomy between instrumentalism and realism. It is wholly unhelpful. Right? Instrumentalists think that we predict with models. Realists think that we use models and, and test their assumptions. You'll note both of those assume what I want to question, that models are in the first instance empirical. Right? Both realists and instrumentalists agree on that. That dichotomy preempts asking the questions that I want to ask. I'm just going to set it aside, and I'm going to point out at a certain point that Thomas Schelling, for example, is an instrumentalist who has criteria other than predictive efficacy for thinking about models as, as tools or instruments. The third thing is, is that we want to keep, at least at the start, a distinction between models and theories. A, a theory makes some substantive claim about the world, right? And there's a whole set of philosophers of science who you, can, who you can refer to to back that up. It's got substantive content. My argument is, is that models tend to not have substantive content in the first instance, and that they do not make substantive claims about the world, that in fact that they're useful for conceptual purposes, that they're going to tell us how to think about and how to talk about, say, rationality and institutions, which is the, the, the focus of the, of the formal work that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, and the fourth thing is, I'm not going to talk at all about your logits and your probits and your, you know, all that kind of stuff. Don't care. Right? So if that's what you think you're going to get, there's the door. Um, I'm going to talk about the two families of formal models that are most prevalent in political science, namely social choice or collective choice models and game theoretic models. So this is solely about the status of formal models in political science, in sociology, where they tend to be used less, not non-existently, and in economics, where they tend to be used uh, even more. Um, so I have two tasks. And the first task is a critical task. I'm going to show you that the standard rationale is, in fact, standard, and that it leads us astray, and that it is unsupported by actual practice in modeling politics and society. 
that if you think the standard rationale, which is, I'll, I'll describe what it is in a minute, is true, you're going to be unhappy when you actually look at what people actually do with models. And that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do there. And then I'm going to give you a plausible alternative, because I think the only thing to be said for the standard rationale is that we haven't thought hard enough about what we're actually doing. Right? So mostly in political science departments, political scientists are busy telling political theorists that they don't know what they're talking about. Tonight's lecture is formal theorists don't know what they're talking about, quite literally. They misunderstand what they're doing at a fundamental level. Nothing I say, let me repeat, nothing I say is meant to or has the consequence of denigrating the use of formal models in political science. The question is, why are we using them, using them what are they good for, and how do we understand that? Right? So I think the bottom line here is that political scientists are led astray, even though they think people like me, political theorists and philosophers, are just a waste of slots and faculty hiring, and don't want to have anything to do with philosophy or political theory. They are held captive by a, a, a philosophical view, positivism, that in the 1960s, when political scientists were embracing it, had already been thrown out by the philosophers who had developed it. It's an embarrassment, but there you go. If you're embarrassed so much. So here's the thing. You can use formal theory, or you can be a positivist. You can't be both. I urge you to keep the models and ditch the positivism. You want to ditch people like me? Ditch me. So I'm going to give you a plausible alternative, and that's going to be to say models are like fables, quite literally like fables, a critical task. So here's the standard rationale. The standard rationale for using formal models in political science goes like this. You construct a model. You solve it, right? You give a deductive proof. You find an equilibrium if you're lucky. Um, usually you find a slew of equilibria, and then you tell a tale about why one is the outcome of the, of the model. And sometimes you, you find that there's disequilibrium. But then you take that, you treat it as an empirical hypothesis, you test it against data beaten into submission by some causal or statistical model. Right? Here's smart people who say this again and again, who say it in your lifetime. Um, John Patty and Maggie Penn like this sentence so much that they say it three times in the course of the same book, the literal sentence. And it's a good sentence, right? It's descriptive of what political scientists think, right? We derive hypotheses, we treat them as empirical predictions, we test those predictions against the world, we may have a division of labor, we may not get good tests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but that's the, that's the gold standard for what we're doing. And all of these people have gone off to do other things besides that prediction and testing, right? John and Maggie are writing about legitimacy in this book. Becky Morton's doing experimental work. Scott DeMarchi has given up the ghost, I guess, on game theory and is doing complex systems. All good stuff, but they're not doing this. And they use these sentences mostly to say, well, I'm not going to do this, but this is what you should do. This is bad advice. So it's an art history lecture sir, all of a sudden. Paul Klee, one of my favorite artists. There's this painting of his called The Twittering Machine. It's whimsical. It's pastels. It's cool. And it is a picture of political science. It seems kind of whimsical. And then you look in the catalog at the Museum of Modern Art, and you find this description. Right? You see that the birds or the fish or whatever they are are tied and there's a hand crank and there's a pit and it looks like they're trying to lure people or unsuspecting subjects over the pit. This is political science because that's the methodological debate about how we use models. We've been lured over a pit, we've fallen into it, and we can't get out. <laughs> 
You think I'm kidding. Except we don't really do the things that they're twittering about. We talk about them. Um, examples. How do we justify using experiments? Experiments are a fad now. Everyone wants to have an experiment. And we want to have experiments because we believe in causal inference of the, of the um, uh, Reuben Holland sort, and that's a mistake. But we use experiments because why? Because we can test the predictions of formal models or we can test the assumptions, the behavioral assumptions of formal models. Right? And you can go to these sources and find essentially the same statements. These are the rich and famous in your discipline. Right? These are the people who have the targets on their backs that you should be taking aim at. Instead, you have old guys like me taking aim at them. Here's the, the second example. How do we justify spending NSF funds on the EITM program? Again and again and again and again and again, we justify that by testing the predictions or the consequences of formal models empirically. So it's not just that John and Maggie and Becky and Scott all talk about this this way. It's built into the practices of the, of the discipline these days, right? The experimenters now have their own section at APSA. They have their own journal. They get into the AJPS and all of this stuff. And there may be good reasons to do experiments. Testing formal models is not among them. There may be good reasons why we want to spend money on the EITM program. Testing formal models is not among them. Right? So part of this is important because this is NSF money and we want to be able to actually say what it is that we're doing with taxpayer dollars. Right? It should make a difference that we get this right. Um, so the problem for the standard rationale, there's a whole set of formal models that don't make any predictions whatsoever. I think that that set can expand to include all formal models. That's a question that I've argued with people uh, about before. But the Nash bargaining model, Arrow's theorem, Schelling's checkerboard model of residential segregation, Akerlof's market for lemons, and this paper by Banks and Kiwi of candidate entry into US congressional elections, one of them is not like the others. The first four all won the Nobel Prize. So we're not talking about lightweights here. We're talking about people who do political economy of the most rewarded and recognized sort. And we're talking about Banks and Kiwi because that's the paper that Becky Morton uses to justify the standard rationale in her book from 1999 or whenever it is, Methods and Models. And the paper that she picks to say that we do the standard rationale, that we derive, we, we, we derive equilibria, we treat them as empirical predictions, we test those predictions against causal models, does not do what she says it does. That's how blinded we are. And Becky is a friend. She's smart. This is how deep the philosophical, mis misleading philosophical views have gone. Um, and, by the way, I'm not saying anything here that I either haven't said in print or that other smart, smarter people than me have said in print, right, about all of these models. I'm not going to talk about these models. I'm going to talk about the University of Rochester. <laughs> they say, right, I went to Catholic school for 10 years. Charity begins at home. <laughs> there you go. So. The University of Rochester is responsible in large measure for populating political science with formal models. And my colleagues do a lot of this, right? And they think they know what they're doing. And when I look at what they're doing, I think, well, not so much. So what I want to look at is the most important contribution of Rochester political science to the discipline. And um, I'm going to think about these as um, as research traditions, um, and I'm going to point out that there's lots of debate 
within this, this tradition over models and methods and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm just dipping my toe in here and saying, here's another argument. I gave this in the department a year ago. It didn't go that well. Well, I thought it went swimmingly. They didn't think that it went swimmingly. So, <laughs> so there's a paper by Bruce Brito de Mesquita and Sonia Amade um, about the Rochester School. It appears in the Annual Review of Political Science. Um, and two things are important. The first is that they identify the standard rationale as animating the work that went on at Rochester starting in the 1960s and going through the present, essentially. Um, and the second is that the most important substantive focus was a set of models and arguments about disequilibrium in politics, mostly shown in spatial models, but not entirely, and about how institutions constrain that indeterminacy in politics. Um, and so notice what I'm doing here. I'm letting people who believe the standard rationale pick the examples. That's why I pointed out the Banks and Kiwi paper. That's why I'm going to BDM, who is a, is a kind of stepchild of the, of the Rochester department. Uh, he taught there for a little while, um, and he buys the standard rationale. And so this is a lesson. Take, let your opponent say what you need to explain, and then explain it. They are committed to the standard rationale. They just don't practice it. This is the substantive focus. The models are incredibly important and insightful. They help us understand politics in deep ways. So again, nothing I'm saying suggests otherwise, suggests that there's not value in these models. So here are the, here are the, the, the turning points in this, in this tradition. You have the McKelvey-Schofield models. McKelvey was a PhD student at Rochester. Uh, Norman Schofield was an economist in in England, who was brought over here by Bill Riker, who is in a rationalist department, the ancestor who we all worship. Um, then we have, and, and that shows rampant indeterminacy in a multidimensional policy space, right? Essentially, you can get from any point in the space to any other point in a finite number of moves and in an institutionally unbound or a minimal institutional environment. The second paper um, uh, or contribution is Ken Shepsley, who's slightly behind McKelvey, who says, wait, we don't see that in the world. We don't see that kind of indeterminacy. But we see how institutions constrain indeterminacy. And he develops this idea about structure-induced equilibria, right? That shows how in especially legislatures, but in other uh, institutional forms as well. Rules and roles constrain the prerogatives and the preferences and the information of agents in various sorts of ways to give us stability, to do away with disequilibrium outcomes. The third thing is what you don't want to have happen to you. Bill Riker comes along and says to his PhD student, Ken, not so fast. Institutional Institutional rules are the same as policies, and in institutional politics, we should see the same sort of indeterminacy, the same sort of disequilibrium, right? You don't want your advisor to do that. Or at least you want him, as is the case here, to be wrong. Randy Calvert comes along sometime later. He's a student of McKelvey and Ordeshuk out at Caltech. Um, so, and then he teaches at the University of Rochester. And he shows not that we have um, institutional equilibria, but that we have equilibrium institutions. And that's a direct response to Riker, who says, we'll have disequilibrium and indeterminacy. And Randy says, no, we won't because institutional rules themselves are equilibria. So think about when Newt Gingrich came to um, Washington with the contract for America. That's probably before most of you were born, mid-Clinton administration. Not the Clinton administration that you hoped would be here now, but the first one. Newt Gingrich came and said, we're going to, like Trump, we're going to drain the swamp. We're going to change everything. 
All the institutions are going to go away. The committee system, the seniority system, we're going to do everything differently and not a thing changed. A few people lost seniority, et cetera, et cetera, but by and large, Congress kept going as it was going. That's the notion that we don't have what Riker thinks. Now, all of these papers are things you should read, right? If you're a political science, this makes you literate in contemporary political science. This is incredibly important work. It allows us to think hard and seriously about what institutions are and how they work at a very abstract level. So you don't have to think about Congress or the courts or the executive branch. You can think about institutions as a thing, as an entity, right? The problem here is that with this substantive focus, there is not an instance in all of that 20-year debate in which any of those turning points adhered to the standard rationale of construct a model, derive an equilibrium outcome, test that outcome against some data beaten into submission by a causal model. Not one point at which that happens. So the story that BDM and Amade tell about the Rochester School fundamentally misconstrues the underlying work that they want to celebrate. I think the underlying work is incredibly important. The story told by the standard rationale is, for lack of a better word, false. It does not capture what happens in any of those papers. We can talk about the individual papers if you want um, in question time, um, but notice where this gets you. This doesn't get you any embarrassment. It's only an embarrassment if the standard rationale is persuasive. And look who it's put you in the company of. People who you'd love to be in the company of. Right? Nash and Schelling and Akerlof and Arrow. You've died and gone to heaven. Except as a political scientist, you are intent on adhering to the standard rationale and you don't have a good reason for doing it. Right? You should be pitching that thing under the bus. Nothing I say is controversial. Chris is laughing. Nothing I say is controversial. I'll say it again. Every point that I've made is made repeatedly in the literature of people talking about the Rochester tradition by people who are in the Rochester tradition. Every single point. Why is it that nobody connects the dots here? because they're blinded by bad philosophy of science. I can give you the citations if you'd like. Crable 1988 is a great example, right? It's a 50-page review essay of all the work coming out of the structure-induced equilibrium tradition, looking at congressional institutions and legislative institutions more generally. And at the end, and he says at the beginning, the, the, the the point of judging any of these models is their empirical performance. And the last paragraph, I think it's the last paragraph, maybe it's the last page, he says, and the models are now approaching testability. Ten years worth of models. It took him 50 pages to just go over the important ones. And they're approaching testability? If your work is that slow, you're in trouble, right? The 2005 paper by Krabo, Meyerowitz, and Woon says, let's try this again, right? So it's 25 years later, and they still cannot discriminate the predictions of the basic models from one another or from a naive base rate model. That's not because the predictions are bad. It's because there are no predictions. They're trying to squeeze Water out of a turnip. So why do this, right? It's sort of, if I stop hitting my head, my head against the wall, I'll feel better. Stop hitting your head against the wall. So the point of this, and in the paper, there's actual discussion of all the models and so on and so forth. The point of this is the most important work coming from a department that's 
fundamentally responsible for introducing formal models into political science. The most important work does not, in any way, shape, or form, adhere to the standard rationale. It's not just the Banks and Kiwi paper, but none of this stuff does. Oh, that's not what's supposed to happen. Ooh, here we go. And here's the point. It's not that they're making poor predictions. It's not that they're making predictions and not testing them because there's some division of labor. It's that none of those models make a prediction at all. There are no predictions. None. Zero. Nada. Zilch. So, how does the standard rationale help you make sense of that work if that's the fundamental way of justifying the work of formal theorists, none of that work is political science. It's something else, but it's not political science. When I explain to my colleagues that all they have to do to rescue the importance of their work is give up philosophy uh, of the sort that they tacitly adhere to, they won't do it. The second point, I've let the defenders of the standard rationale pick their own cases. The third point is, there's no way of partitioning this between pure and applied work, um, as Becky Morton suggests, so that we don't want to pay attention to the McKelvey Schofield stuff because it's pure theory. Um, um, the, the Banks and Kiwi paper and the Shepsley paper are as applied as they get. They're talking about actual political institutions. Ken is a Congress scholar. That's why he's doing this stuff. You also can't do it by, in terms of, um, as Crable and Deermeyer want to do, in terms of the methodology. Well, of course, collective choice models don't make good predictions, and so we can set that aside, but the game theory models make good predictions. You remember the Calvert paper that, that punctuates this argument is a set of game theoretic models of institutional, of equilibrium institutions. So those partitioning strategies don't work, right, as defensive mechanisms. So the problem, again, is not with the models. The models are cool. They're really interesting. They tell you stuff that you want to know. They give you a way of thinking about why institutions work and why they work as they do and why we don't have indeterminacy in politics of that sort. What we lack I think, is a plausible alternative of why we use models, what we use them for. And that gets me to the alternative view. And that is that we use models as fables. And like fables, we use models for conceptual purposes. Now, that's important to think back to the first slide where I said I'm not going to talk about Loudon and Kitcher who tell you that in chemistry we care about conceptual issues. So we don't need to get nervous here that we're getting far away from the empirical questions, right? Chemists and biologists do this sort of thing too. So you can relax, take a deep breath. The anxiety will pass. Thomas Schelling says this about models. Models are tools. He's an instrumentalist. He's not an instrumentalist of the standard sort that you get from reading Milton Friedman's 1958 paper on the methodology of positive economics, which says that all we care about is testing the empirical implications of our models, right? He's an instrumentalist in the sense of saying, we use these models and they ha actually help us talk about things, right? They help us communicate. And what I think that they help us communicate about are unobservable entities. Now that's going to sound, smell a little bit metaphysical to you, right? We're talking about what kinds of things are there in the world. I'm going to tell you that there are normative concepts in the world. There are concepts like rationality in the world, that we can take them out and we can talk about them and we can agree and disagree. There are institutions in the world that are not observable and we can talk about institutions and we can do that with the modeling framework that the Rochester folks have given or supplied us with. Doesn't this sound fishy to you? Ariel Rubinstein doesn't think it sounds fishy. He of the, uh, the Rubinstein bargaining model. Jan Elster, who is my dissertation advisor and uh, uh, 
in, in the interest of full disclosure. I'm not on his holiday card list anymore because he told me I was wrong and I didn't listen to him. Um, <laughs> he, he thinks that the models are mostly conceptual. Dan Hausman, who's a philosopher of economics, philosopher of science, who focuses on economics up at Wisconsin, thinks not only that, that they're conceptual, but that as a consequence we should see that attempts to, to, to empirically test models of this sort is a, are a category mistake. So all of the people who think that we use experiments to test the assumptions or the predictions of formal models are making a category mistake. It's like not having the right sort of variable on the right-hand side of your regression analysis. It's baby stuff that you learn or should learn in your first year of graduate school. But political science as a whole has not learned this. So what do we mean by models? In order to understand this, you'd have to actually read some philosophy of science. I know that that is anathema to most of you and surely to most of the people who are your advisors. One of my good friends, Chris Aiken, says, when I retire, then I can think about philosophy of science. <laughs> Except for the fact that not reading it gets you the situation that we're in, where people are holding dear to a philosophical view and doing something completely different. And if anybody paid attention, we should all be embarrassed. So we have at least three views, interpretations of models. We have a set of people who advocate those interpretations. We have the question about whether we want to treat them as linguistic entities. We have a question about whether models can be true or false or not. And we have a question about whether they sustain this distinction between theories and models that I said was important at the outset. And that's going to be important because we use our models and they contribute to our theories. They just don't contribute to our theories in an empirical way. So the syntactic view, Deborah Satz and John Farajan, Keith Dowding, uh, all friends of mine, think that we have models, that they have a syntactic structure, that they make true or false claims about the world, and that there is no model theory distinction because they don't really talk about models at all. They just talk about theories. The semantic view that comes from um, not Richard Gere, Ronald Gere, um, and my two colleagues, uh, Kevin Clark and David Primo, say, no, models are not linguistic entities. Now, they don't want them to be linguistic entities because they want to say that models can be useful but not true, right? And if they're not linguistic, if they're maps, then we're not making statements about the world, then we can't have truth value assigned to them. And... They don't have a model theory distinction because on the semantic view, a theory just is a collection of models, right? So my initial statement that models are substantive claim, uh, theories are substantive claims about the world is a contentious statement. Clark and Primo, who are, have offices on the same hallway as me, think the exact opposite. I do not care here whether you believe what I say. I don't want you to believe the standard rationale, or I want you to refurbish the standard rationale so it's vaguely plausible, or you could come up with some other alternative. That's, the point here is not to get you to believe and take my position. The point here is to get you to think about what you're doing, to use your time thinking about methodology in a kind of productive way. The view that I believe is this predicate view. It says yes, Models are linguistic entities. They are essentially conceptual or definitional so that we say, here's what rationality means in this or that circumstance. Here's what institutions mean for this purpose or that purpose. They can be not, cannot be true or false, except in the trivial sense that a definition is true, right? It's true by definition. So not very helpful to think about truth or falsity. And it allows us to think about this distinction between theories and models. And we're going to go along to that. I'm going to suggest that you like the predicate view. If you don't, knock yourselves out. 
So I gave you a, a bunch of, of philosophers and philosophers of science who think that we either have to have the semantic view or the syntactic view. Um, Nancy Cartwright is a famous philosopher of science who you should read, um, University of uh, California, San Diego, who thinks that both of them represent vending machine kinds of views of models, which is you set the parameters, you put in your quarter, you push the button, clunk, clunk, out comes the solution. She thinks that that fundamentally misunderstands how hard it is to make models and how important it is to make models. But both of them have that fundamental impulse to, um, to um, think about empirics as the way, or the way that models represent as being fundamental. Um, this distinction, some people who take the semantic view think that the predicate view is not sufficiently distinct. I think it's distinct in precisely the way of saying we use models for conceptual purposes and not for empirical purposes. Kevin and David go on and on and on and on about how maps, their analogy, represent or don't represent the world. I think, in fact, none of the models that I've talked about so far that I've mentioned actually represent the world at all. They represent certain kinds of conceptual issues, and they allow us to talk about those conceptual issues. Again, two families of models, social choice and game theory. Um, we'll skip that. Models as fables. Nancy Cartwright has a, lo a lovely paper called Models as Fables. And I read that paper, and I thought, this is really smart, right? And her claim is the following. We have abstract concepts. She uses the concept of force in classical mechanics, right? So this is not just about economics, but she also uses a set of examples from economics. We're going to use the concept of rationality, right, or the concept of institution, because that's what the Rochester people were talking about. That's the kind of, kind of use that, that political scientists um, rely on. Um, and that what a model does is take us from some abstract concept of rationality and allow us to say, in this circumstance, with these parameters, in this kind of context, here's what rationality means. Right? It's a conceptual move. It's moving from abstract to concrete. So everything that you've learned about how formal models are about moving from concrete to abstract gets it exactly backwards. So here's, so here's what you have to do, right? You read, Nancy, you read Nancy Cartwright and you think, well, she's a weird philosopher. So I thought, is this true? Is this how we think about fables generally? And I did this funny thing. I went to the library. That's that brick building over there, and it has these things in it called books. And there's a book there by a literary critic, H.J. Blackham, called The Fable in Literature, that starts with Aesop and comes to Animal Farm, right? And it talks about all kinds of fables in between, and here's what he says. Fables are stories adapted to generate a conception or to expand, refashion, or refine, or reinforce a conception. That's basically Cartwright's point. And if you read Rawls or Dworkin in your political theory classes, you'll note that they have a, a distinction between a concept of justice, say, justice as a very abstract thing, and justice as fairness for Rawls. And Rawls has a model called the original position. Right? And the original position is a way of talking about how we, what we mean by justice is fairness. So we've gone from abstract to concrete. Moreover, a fable is usually focused on a single matter of general character and not about things in general. So we want to know what does rationality mean in this or that situation, in this or that context. The whole business is to be concrete, to show the kind of thing some conceptual matter is in practice. So, going back to the Banks and Kiwi paper that Becky Morton uses as an, as an example of 
the standard rationale, the actual way that that paper works is to take on a bunch of people who say observed patterns in the world in which we get weak challengers to incumbent congressmen cannot be rational behavior on the part of the weak challengers or on the part of the stronger challengers who do not enter the race. And what Jeff and Rod do is show that under certain kinds of circumstances, here's our model, it is Nash behavior for challengers of the different sorts to act in the way that they act. They are not making a prediction they are not doing anything else. There's a statistical model in there, but the model is not meant to test that prediction, the, the, the statistics. It's meant to ask the question about what do we think about the conditions necessary for this model to work in the proper way, right? Is it crazy? Is it ridiculously restrictive? What's going on? But for weak candidates to stay out against incumbents and uh, strong candidates to stay out and weak candidates to enter, Nash behavior rationality in this context. We can talk about that paper um, if you want to. Still not working. Here's what you're thinking. You can admit it. It's fine. You will not hurt my feelings. Literary? That's what those crazy political theorists down the end of the hall in the political theory ghetto talk about. The ones that you wear garlic to keep at bay. Yes. Fables. Roger Meyerson, Nobel laureate in game theory. When we make social scientific models, we are really constructing fables. Ariel Rubinstein, soon to be Nobel laureate in game theory. The word model sounds more scientific. So this is the Peter Venkman view, right? Right? From Ghostbusters, the Institute for Paranormal Research. If I wear a lab coat, it makes me a scientist, right? If I call it a model instead of a fable, it makes me a scientist. Rubinstein doesn't care about that. He says, sounds more scientific than fable, but there's not much difference. In fact, there's zero difference. Not exactly zero, but close to zero. So it's not just crazy philosophers like Nancy Cartwright. And part of how I got to, got to thinking about this is people who I think are really smart, Meyerson and Rubinstein are really smart. Rubinstein actually does experimental work in economics. He just doesn't think that we're doing this testing business. Right? They, they don't get any better than this. The formal modelers in, in, in political science departments are second stringers. They're my friends, but compared to these guys, they're second stringers. Right? It's, it, it's fact. So, what do we do with fables? What we do with fables is we derive morals from them. We derive lessons from them. They're tools of practical reasoning. What do I do in this context or that context? How do I learn something from this context or that context that can help me navigate the world? These two books are things that you should look at. The Meyerson book is really a little monograph. It was a set of lectures that he gave at the Army War College in which he says, when we make models, we're making fables. Right. This book saves me a lot of work because McCartan, despite the fact that I think he probably disagrees with 90% of the syllables I've uttered tonight, gives you 49, count them, four dozen plus one models and the morals that fall out of those models. And he sets those morals off in red ink on the second page of every presentation of every model. Meyerson and all of the 49 models in there that are foundational to everything you do in thinking about political economy or Congress or anything else like that these days are all making models and treating them as fables 
my, Roger's at least a man of conviction and recognizes that he's doing that. None of these people do. All right? So, yes, fables are literary. Yes, models always have stories attached to them. Here's Cartwright. We treat models as mediators. They mediate between our theories and the world somehow. They do that the, between our, they, they model between our theories and the world. Models stand independently and they mediate by allowing us to say, here's what rationality means. Here's what institution means. The domain of a theory extends just as far as the models extend, as far as our idea about rationality can extend. So the Banks and Kiwi paper is really great in that respect because it's saying what people heretofore thought could not be rational is in fact rational under these conditions and by this definition, period, right? It's extending the range of that concept. Cartwright is great on this. We have representative models. Your logits and your probits and all of that stuff in some sense claim to represent the world. Our formal models don't. They're interpretive models, as she puts them, puts it. And it means that what we are asking there is what does it mean, what does, it, what does rationality amount to in some artificial circumstance? What does it consist in? in some artificial circumstance, that circumstance being the parameters of the model. We can skip that. Here's one of my favorite examples of navigating the world. Well, Roger was navigating the world because he's going to the Army War College to try and persuade officers how to think about deterrence. That's really important because if they get it wrong, lots of people die. This is a mathematician, Felix Breuer, I think his name is, um, at a teach-in at Berkeley after the cops shot down people with rubber bullets in the streets of Oakland during the Occupy uh, days, um, teaching McKelvey's theorem on the quad at Berkeley at a teach-in about why resistance is more important to democracy than voting. It's great. And here's where you can find it online. But he says, the title of my talk is The Ge Geometry of Majority Vote and the Power of Agenda Control. And its topic was McKelvey's theorem, a surprising result with beautifully intuitive proof that can be made accessible to everyone. It's moral in this context. It's moral in this context is that protest, struggle for the control of the agenda, is a much more important element of democracy than voting. And so what are we talking about now? We're talking about income, well, we wish we were. Now we're talking about stolen SCOTUS seats. But we, the political agenda is really about the 1% and the 90%, 99% and equality and distributional issues and so on and so forth. That's part of the importance here. Um, how do we use concepts in social science? I'll give you this example, and then I'll stop, pretty much. Um, John Aldrich, it's a classic. Why parties? If you study American politics, you will have read it. What does he do? In chapter two, he introduces about six or seven formal models. He does not prove anything. He does not derive predictions. He does not even work them through. He just says, here's what I mean by collective action. Here's what I mean by institutions. Here's what I mean by rationality. Now I'm going to go out and tell you about parties as structure-inducing, equilibrium-inducing structures in the political system. That's what the book is about. The theory is substantive. It's about politics and party politics. The models that he relies on are about the concepts of institution and rationality and collective action and instability, etc. And he plugs those models in. He doesn't test them. He allows him to talk about those things in a kind of consistent way. So we talk about rational choice models. And the bottom line here is, is that we don't assume rationality and derive predictions from that. 
as Schelling and, von no uh, and, and Morgenstern say, what we do is we use these models to ask what rationality means, to define rationality. I want these guys on my side. They are on my side, so I'm happy. Um, we talked about banks and kiwi. We talked about banks and kiwi. And here's from the final paper, the Calvert paper. Institution, what he's doing is defining institutions as equilibrium outcomes in some repeated game. Institution is just a name we give to certain parts of certain kinds of equilibria. Period. There's no prediction. So it can't adhere to the standard rationale. And unless you want to throw out this kind of work, you have no reason for saying why it's valuable. And that gives people like Green and Shapiro and Jerry Mackey and so on a lot of rope with which to hang you or think that they've hung you. And here's the conclusion. Many of you will be thinking, oh, I just want to study crisis bargaining or I just want to study Congress. I want to study the court. I want to study coalition formation and parliamentary systems. Why do I have to think about this stuff? Well, you're here thinking about logits and probits. If you're studying coalition formation, you're learning how to do, to solve game theoretic models for, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, subgame perfect equilibria. That's heavy lifting, right? Why are you doing that? You're not doing it because the formal models are going to give you empirical predictions. I don't care. I don't care whether you believe my story about fables. I do care that you see that the standard rationale is wholly inadequate and that it leaves you with, if you're interested in using formal models or working in the shadow of people who use formal models, with no foundation for what you're doing. And oftentimes, it's good to have a defense of what you're doing because there will be someone sitting at your first job talk in the audience, like me, who will ask you, why would I think in terms of these kinds of models? It happened to me a long time ago. It's going to happen to you, too. If you're using these models, why would you do that? So the burden of argument is on people who want to adhere to the standard rationale or who think that they can turn their backs on any attempt to justify why people should pay attention to the work that involves formal modeling. I'll stop. <laughs>